So um, today we're going to talk about ECMAScript 6. Like, how many here are actually playing around with ECMAScript 6 already? So you all know the secret harmony switches on Node or stuff like that. Anybody using Treasure or whatever it's called, uh, one of the free compilers? It seems like most of the action is happening in the browser these days, not on Node.js yet, but it's coming. This month, they're supposed to ratify the um, actual drafts um, of the ECMAScript 6. So hopefully by the end of the year, we'll actually all be using ECMAScript 6 uh, default in Node and IOJS. So what are we going to do um, today? We're basically going to go a little bit, um, talk a little bit about ECMAScript 6 and some of the features. And I'm actually just going to look at the features that are kind of useful for the driver in, in the context of uh, doing development on the server side. How many here actually knows all of the features of ECMAScript 6, so I've read some of them? So there's actually quite a few here who will learn something useful then. That's good. And then we're going to touch a little bit on MongoDB Core, which is part of the driver uh, refactoring that happened into Zero. And uh, then we are going to go a little bit around uh, ECMAScript 6 prototype that uh, you can play around with that's on, uh, on NPM. And we're going to look at quickly a little bit of performance and see what's the actual cost of using ECMAScript 6 over current ECMAScript 5 with, uh, as it exists today in Node. So he already introduced me, so I'm going to skip this slide. So ECMAScript 6 is much more than just adding stuff to JavaScript. It's in many ways a fundamental rethink of how the JavaScript language is going to evolve going forward. It introduces a massive amount of new features. And the ones I'm actually outlining here are just like small parts of the total feature set. But the things that I kind of care about is iterators and generators, proxies, promises, and classes. And after that, there's like tons of other stuff. And if you're really interested, you can go and read the 200-page uh, TC39 spec, which is the ECMAScript uh, 6 spec, because uh, there's lots of little goodies in there that will make your life a lot easier. Uh, but we're just going to look a little bit more in-depth in, on this particular set of features. So classes are not classes in the context of what you might be used from other or object-oriented languages. They're more of a syntactic sugar that lives on top of the existing prototype model of JavaScript. It doesn't introduce any new object-oriented concepts. So the inheritance model is actually exactly the same as prototypes. But it basically just takes some of those core concepts that people are doing again and again and again and simplifies it into a set of like uh, language features. And what do you mean by that? Well, until now, like people tend to uh, use uh, very particular patterns to do inheritance. So what classes does is it basically hides those patterns for view and makes it more readable. And to define a class in ECMAScript 6, you literally just use the keyword, the new keyword cursor, for example, in this case, defining a new class cursor. The constructor is a special um, keyword for defining the actual constructor of that uh, object. And defining methods is as simply as just doing accounts and then brackets. You don't have to do the uh, you know cursor.prototype and then add the methods or use the this in the constructor. Uh, you can do inheritance. So you can take a special the cursor and turn it into a special cursor. And you can even call the uh, constructor of the superclass by just simply calling super. So it's quite nice, quite simple. Um, it does not have things um, like, you know, interfaces or any such complicated concepts. There's still no concept of private, public, uh, uh, and, and protected. Uh, so uh, oh, uh, there's no private, uh, protected, or public concepts. You have to still use the same workarounds that you use in JavaScript if you want to do, uh, do it in ECMAScript 6. The next one is iterators. So we finally get uh, iterators. And that allows you to actually define behavior for how JavaScript objects um, uh, work right? as iterations. It includes a new construct, which is called for off, which actually works as you thought for in works. It's like most people think that for in actually does the right thing, but it doesn't. Right? How many people have been bit by for in here? There you go. We all do that mistake, right? Um, arrays are actually now proper iterators. And uh, that's maps as well. So you can actually do for off, and you get that behavior that you always wanted with for in. And you can define your own type of iterators. So if you have an object, basically you just have to define an implicit protocol 
which is returning an object that has a value done, which basically specifies if the editor has finished or is still, uh, still has values, and a, a value field that actually has uh, the JavaScript value. And this you pass back as uh, in, in a function call next. And as a simple example, um, in this case, we have a very simple class that takes and uh, iterates uh, to infinity in the numbers by just incrementing the a counter. And uh, what we're seeing here is we do uh, next up prototype. And symbol iterator is a special thing that is in XML script 6, a special constant that just basically gives you the name of the iterator uh, method that you need to define, in this case, next. Uh, you pa it passes back a function, and we, we return an uh, internal value object that has the, uh, the next function. And as you see, we're, it's always set to false, so it's never done because you're constantly uh, allowing to increase the number. And we return the curse plus plus, which is you know incrementing number. And at the end, we basically do an var n off using the ability to actually work on iterators. Um, and at a thousand, we do a break. So it's, it's pretty straightforward. You can take any object you have, implement this pattern, and now it suddenly can be an iterator, right? You can already probably think of a thousand places you thought like to do that. Main problem here is that this doesn't necessarily work 100% of the, uh, the things that you want, and we'll get into that a little bit uh, later. Um, the next thing is something that probably a lot of you already use. Promises? Anybody uses promises here? Yes. Well, that's good. That's more than I thought it would be. So a promise is literally an object that use, is used for deferring an asynchronous uh, operation, right? So a promise doesn't actually execute the operation. What it does is basically allow you to defer it until you specifically want to resolve it. And you can chain them. So you can basically have one promise uh, flow into another promise, flow into another promise. Or you can uh, execute an X number of promises in parallel, uses promises all. It's really just, um, a like the promises as it exists in ECMAScript 6, it's really just um, kind of like a, uh, defined uh, interface of functions that you have to implement. And most of the promise libraries out there that you can use are all uh, already compatible with um, the ECMAScript 6 one. So you can kind of uh, replace the standard ECMAScript 6 one with one that features uh, more uh, orchestration uh, ability than the, the standard uh, ECMAScript 6 one does. And it's extremely useful to make uh, reasoning about your codes easier because the flow is more controlled. And more importantly, and we're going to get into that in a little bit, is that it plays really well into some other aspects of ECMAScript 6 that will make our lives a lot easier. So just as we did earlier, a very simple uh, example of a promise. The first uh, part of it uh, creates a new promise and assigns it to the P2 variable. And um, when that promise gets executed, it actually just uh, calls resolve. If you call reject, that's the same as uh, returning an error. All right, so uh, the equivalent version of a Node.js callback would be uh, a reject is basically like calling the callback with the uh, first uh, value parameter set to an error object, and resolve is uh, calling it with the result and setting the error object to null. Uh, we then take the p2 and uh, we do dot then, which means we're basically going to resolve this promise. And we assert that the value 2 is what is returned from the promise once it's resolved. And as we can see, that uh, will resolve itself because the p2.1 will always return 2. The example below is um, using basically the all. Right? In this case, we basically have a new promise that resolves to 3. And we then execute both true and that promise and we get back basically all the values in an array for all of those promises that we actually did. Since the promises basically are just values in the end, true will be returned as the first value in this case, which is kind of a, one of those funny little corny cases of promises that is surprising. So given we have promises, we get to the kind of next step. And that's one of the more exciting aspects, and I think one of the most important aspects of like script 6, and that's generators. So a generator is a specific function that you can enter and exit continuously multiple times. Right? 
in between the times that you're actually entering the method and exiting it, the state of the method is kept. All right? So it's like, you're, it's like running the method for a while, pausing it, then uh, resuming the method at that point, then pausing it, then resuming the method. Right? You can actually, when you call a generator function, you get an iterator back, one that has a next function on it. So in, it actually follows the exact same concept of the traditional iterators. However, you can't really use iterators with for off because they're implicitly asynchronous. So if you do a for off, it will actually not allow you to do that. So when you call next on the iterator, it will execute your uh, generator function until it hits the keyword yield. And then it will return the result of uh, the function that you yielded to. So if you look at the previous example with rewrite it as a generator, you'll see that uh, the only difference really here is that where we were doing returning next in an actual iterator, we're just yielding the actual uh, the next value of cur. And uh, we're still doing n off in this case because there's no asynchronous operations in this particular generator. But if you try to put, like, say, an asynchronous operation inside of this particular generator, and you have a yield inside of that one, you'll get an error. Like the for uh, the um, the uh, for off will basically uh, error out, and then and you get a warning from uh, nodes that this isn't allowed. One of the uh, most useful libraries that I'd like you to, if you have the opportunity, to look at is a module called CO. So CO is a small module that takes a, and runs a generator to the end. And it expects to yield on promises. So here we have basically a generator where each function that you're operating on is returning a promise. And it will just run the generator all the way to the end. And it will simplify basically the way you structure your code. And a simple example of using CO with a generator is if you have a similar uh, promise as we had before, we can now just do co, wrap the generator function, so function star, and we just do yield on the promise, and it will return the actual value returned from resolve in the promise. Now, if you reject, it basically gets thrown, and in co, you can catch that at the very, very end by adding a catch uh, function handler. Um, but the nice thing about generators and actual um, Yielding is that like, if you'd want to, you could actually try catch the, the P1 exception inside of the code, which is now impossible. Right, right now in Node.js, you can't really do that. But in this here, you can actually do, let me run this operation and try catch it inside of the uh, generator, and you will get the exception as, you, as if you were doing a, a, synchronous, a normal synchronous programming. So after generators, one of the other things that I looked at that was you know, I find useful for uh, a driver is uh, dynamic proxies. So how many people here have ever used Ruby method missing? You know about the magic, right? So method missing in Ruby for the people who have no experience uh, in Ruby allows you to intercept anything that happens on an object. Right? So you have an object in Ruby and somebody calls a method start on it, but it doesn't exist. Well, method missing will trap that, and then you can do something with it. Proxies is similar to that in the way that you can actually take a proxy and wrap an instance of a uh, JavaScript object, and you can intercept property lookups, assignments, function calls, and enumer enumerations. Main problem is, though, that there are some performance implications. I'll cover that briefly. But a simple example uh, using a proxy is like you have a handler like this, and the handler itself is a proxy. Like you don't need to define and follow specific keywords to kind of use uh, tap into the proxy behavior. In this case, we're using uh, the get, uh, and we're overriding that. And the first parameter of the get function is the target, which is the actual object that is being it's being invoked on, and uh, the name of the actual property that we're trying to access. And in this example, what we're basically doing is that if the property already exists on the object that we're wrapping with our proxy, we're just going to return that value. Otherwise, we're going to return 37. Right? So we create a proxy by just saying new proxy. This does not work in iOS or Node right now. 
because they still haven't implemented the, uh, the correct version of the proxy specification. But there are some nice kind of like uh, uh, kind of shims that you can get from NPM that will uh, give you the right API for uh, the actual final specification. So in this case, we're wrapping an empty object. And uh, we're setting A to 1 and B to undefined. And we then, when we then uh, print A and print B, we're going to get 1 and undefined because we set those values, right? If you then try to print um, C, for example, we're going to get 37, right? Because it didn't exist, so the proxy basically fell back to 37. So it's kind of cool. You can already, maybe a lot of you are already thinking, shit, I can do like dynamic objects and like, you know, ODMs or whatever with proxies and it just map directly to, to rows or whatever. There are some implications with proxies that we will touch when we talk about like how we use these features to create a prototype driver. But before we get to the actual prototype driver, I need to introduce MongoDB core. So when I rewrote like 1.4 to 2.0. One of the main reasons I did that was that I needed to pull out everything of the low-level stuff in MongoDB uh, in the driver into a separate project because I found myself that it was unmaintainable. Like it just was not feasible to keep working on the 1.4 code base long term, and so I pulled out all of the basic low-level stuff into MongoDB core. So this is not something you want to use as an end user. It's more like if you're if you have a big plan for a new ODM or a fancy framework or something like that, and you want to, you don't really want to have all those abstractions that you have in the actual main driver, this is the thing that you want, right? It's really low level. It has like no abstractions. There's no concept of databases, collections, anything like that. It's developed specifically for people who are doing ODMs. If you're writing your own wrapper because you have a specific uh, interest in a specific way of doing programming, or let's say you're doing TypeScript or you're doing CoffeeScript or whatever, and you, you don't really care about uh, trying to wrap these higher level abstractions, like this is the thing for you. Or if you're doing tools or frameworks. Very simple example. Like this thing does not have like any URI um, ability to discover topology. You need to know exactly what you're connecting to. In this case, we're connecting to a server, and we're uh, registering a listener on the connect event. And when we then get an actual connect event, we're going to execute the command is master, and we're going to do that against systems dot dollar command. Uh, who knows what systems dot dollar command is? And that's why you shouldn't be using this, <laughs> probably. <laughs> This is a magic command uh, collection that exists on MongoDB. And that's how you execute commands. And at the end, we just destroy it. So that's basically the core of MongoDB core. If you absolutely want to try it, you can do an NPM install MongoDB core. It's, it's a very thin API. It only has like auth, insert, update, remove, command, and cursor. That's it. So that brings me to kind of the heart of this presentation, which is the ECMAScript 6 prototype. And I mean it's prototype, so like don't use this in production. Like are you, if you do it, I mean like I can't guarantee that you're gonna have a pleasant experience. So be warned. This is like more of an investigation into like what kind of possibilities and improvements we can deliver to the community when using uh, Node.js with ECMAScript 6. So the goal was to uh, leverage the features of ECMAScript 6 that could improve productivity. And I wanted to make sure there was like no significant performance degradation if you made the switch from ECMAScript 5 to ECMAScript 6. So how many people have seen code like this? Callback hell, people call it. I usually call it banana code. Some people call it pyramid code. So this is kind of like the thing that we always end up. And then, you know, the typical transition of a um, node developer tends to be, you start writing this, you have some horrible nested callback hell, then you discover the async library. How many people discovered async? Yes, oh, yes, yeah, okay. You start using that, then you go like, oh my god, this is even more worse, I have no idea what's going on anymore. And then you start decomposing everything into methods and like flattening it out as much as possible. And that's like kind of what every all of us go through. And since I've been with Node.js since like 1.0, that's like five years ago. So like we uh, all, if you ask anybody who's like working a uh, long time, like Tim Caswell or all these people, none of them use any of these things, right? They just all decompose themselves into small methods. So what if you can go from this to this, right? 
And this is the promise of the generators. Right? This is like why I hope that after you go out of this meeting, you're going to go, I'm going to try download Node.js or IOJS and start playing around with generators. So here we're basically taking um, what was the banana code and like, made it into something that looks extremely similar to synchronous code. Right? We call uh, yield on the Mongo client connect. So that means that it will like, kind of block in the generator. It will defer that generator until the connection happens. And then after that, we do an insert one. And in this case, just for the fun of it, I, I wrapped it in a try catch block so that you can see that you can actually ca catch that exception right there and then. And then uh, finally, we just do uh, find and turn that into an array of documents. And that's it. Like, like It went from this to that, which is much more readable, right? So what kind of things that we did we do for the ECMA 6 driver? Well, the, the driver only uses the MongoDB core thing as the basis. So it doesn't really, I mean, its behaviors are different to what you're used to in the uh, uh, node native driver. That does some uh, things that are, some things that are, I'm proud of, some things I'm not so proud of, but are still there because backwards compatibility guarantees more than anything else. The, it kind of leverages mostly things like classes, promises, and uh, once you've actually done promises, it, this is, should work. Uh, it will work with a CO, uh, the, the NPM module, or any other module that resolves uh, generators. And it's also going to be forward compatible with ECMAScript 7, which will introduce uh, async and await. And then uh, proxies, right? So let's look at uh, how we use the different aspects of it in the driver. So for the prototype, we basically used uh, classes to define a DB collection cursor, aggregation cursor, command cursor, and Mongo client. The prototype has a minimal API. There's like no helpers there. There's no add user, remove user, anything like that. It's just the core basic stuff. And for the promises, it's fairly simple. Like, let's take a look at how the command function looks. All, right? all the functions return promises. There's no callbacks in the prototype. So no more callbacks, always promises. We're, in this case, we're doing uh, we're creating a new promise based on this options promise, and uh, that's I will get into in a moment why we're doing that. All it does is it goes to the topology, which is a MongoDB core concept, calls the command, and if it, there's an error, it rejects it, and if there's uh, if it's, there's a value and there's no error, it resolves the uh, the value. Right. And the reason it has this options promise is that. One of the biggest things about promises is that everybody wants to bring their own promise library. And uh, I wanted to ensure that that was possible, so I said BYOP, bring your own promises. All right? and, and people love Bluebird, Q, there's like a ton of them out there. To do that, it's fairly simple. Um, once again, we put it inside of a generator. And before we do connect among clients, we do that promise library, we pass it the promise function of whatever promise library is the flavor of the month, and then do connect. So what about promises and iteration? Uh, iteration in 2.0 is absolutely different from like how you do it in, um, uh, in 2.1, sorry, uh, or this, this uh, sorry, the, in the ECMAScript 6 thing, is completely different from what, what you do in 2.0. One of the things there's like no for each or each methods because you just don't need them anymore. So the only functions there are on the cursor is actually to array, next, and has next. And to iterate over cursor, you can now do while, and then you yield to the promise coming back from cursor has next. While that is true, you basically print out the next document by yielding to the next function. The reason why we're doing it like that is because, unfortunately, uh, or fortunately, I'm not 100% sure, but there are situations where you are querying MongoDB, and like say your query is going to be split into two different batches, and you execute, you get the first batch back, it says it gives your cursor ID. Meanwhile, something else deletes the document that's left on the server. So that although you actually have a cursor ID that says there's documents left, by the time you actually go and fetch the next batch, there might not be any documents. So we actually have to go and check first. Alternatively, you could rewrite this by basically just iterating until next returns null. But to make it a little bit more clean and follow more like normal conventions, I, I picked an example where I'm using has next. So where do we use proxies? Well, proxies, we're using that basically to resolve databases and 
uh, collections, right? So right now you have to do you know db dot collections pass it the name of the collection. Um, in this case, basically we can do this simply as just brackets tests that will give us a test database, and then we want to uh, get a collection, so we can just brackets cursors, and that will give us uh, the cursor collection. And the practice in behind is basically intercepting um, when we're trying to do a get property, and then like you know. Barring the fact that you're trying to get a property named exactly the same as a method on the prototype, where when it will throw uh, an error, uh, it will actually uh, give you the right DB object or the D, uh, right collection object. So it's a lot simpler, like uh, more intuitive. So what's the gotchas when it comes to proxies? So they come with some pretty uh, bad performance implications. The reason is that the way V8 actually does uh, optimization in the background is that when you create a new prototype, it tries to define that as, as a concrete class itself, like when it's jitting, right? So if you have a class called um, car, and all the functions always take the same parameters and they're of the same types, it can actually optimize that down to a concrete class that always expects it to be an integer or something. So it's pretty obvious that proxies are poison. Right to this particular optimization because there's like no way V8 can ever know what is the possible concrete class of a proxy. That doesn't mean that proxies aren't useful. It just means that if you choose the first way of iterating across um, uh, of doing inserts, like in this uh, the first case of four here, where we are actually doing using the proxy for every single insert. We're going to pay that penalty of going through all of those optimized code paths in the uh, V8 engine. If we instead basically first use the proxies to get a reference to the collection and then use that reference to do insert, then we only incur that penalty once. And this, in general, is a good um, thing to do and as a pattern when you're using the driver because you're avoiding unnecessary creation of collections, objects. So, what's the performance like? Negligible. Right? There's like n n nearly no difference in performance between uh, using uh, ECMAScript 6 with generators versus using ECMAScript 5, and that's today, right? And and that's like you know with with kind of like half-hearted slap together functionality in in, in uh, Node and IOGS. Once they've optimized this, like over the next couple of months, it might actually get better. So it looks really really promising. So What's the main use uh, release? You can install the MongoDB ES6 uh, driver if you want by just doing npm install MongoDB ES6. It works with Node um, 0.12.2 uh, and IOGS to zero or higher. Um, and I mean, I'll be happy to uh, get any feedback from you and about things or issues or things you don't understand, or if you want to contribute, me, I'm happy to take those as well. As I said, this is a testbed driver more than anything. So any people who come up with some smart thing they can do with ECMAScript 6, awesome. I'll, I'll be listening. So there's like one more thing before we end this presentation. There's Ulta 2.1 Alpha with just promises. Right. So if you today do npm install MongoDB at 2.1 alpha, you can play with that. And it's completely backwards compatible with 2.0. So if you don't use promises, you won't notice. But if you want to use promises, you can. It's fairly simple, to, similar to the ECMAScript 6 stuff. It doesn't use any of these fancy classes or, or, or anything of that. But you can basically do a Mongo, uh, Mongo client dot connect as you uh, always do. You can pass this, uh, pass it your own, um, you know, promise library. In this case, Bluebird, or you can just uh, default to either the ECMAScript 6 one if it's available, or the ECMAScript 6 uh, promise uh, npm module that is a shim for the promises. And then you can use promises as normal and do dot then function, uh, and then uh, basically use promises everywhere where there is an uh, actual callback uh, available. And I know a lot of people have been asking for this, so hopefully uh, this is at least a step in the in the direction of like helping you get there. And I don't know if we're going to be able to do like you know gradual um, merging features in from the prototype into the actual uh, official supported driver, mostly because I think some of them are not shimmable, 
going forward. And I really don't want to use uh, cross compilers to create a version that would work for you, because it'd be horrible to try to figure out what the bugs are if you send me a GitHub uh, issue. But um, I'm I'm keeping track of like how you know the different driver uses are, and like maybe as it gets more adoption in ECMAScript 6, the 3.0 driver might actually include full ECMAScript 6 support. And that concludes basically what the state of the driver in ECMAScript 6 is. And I'm open for questions and answers. Do you expect the promise, the, or the, the 2.1 alpha that just has the promises to get to become the new stable version sometime in the near future? Yeah. I just want to say thank you for that. <laughs> I know. The thing is, like, I've been fielding questions, like, I, just at least once uh, every two weeks or so, there's somebody asking, Where, where's my promises? And I've always have to say the same thing. I don't feel I'm close enough to actually getting them to, pr you know, stamp that damn, like, specification as approved to want to commit to something that I then have to hack around because it wasn't the right version. But I feel pretty comfortable that, like, the, the moment they actually stamp it approved, the alpha thing will go off and it will be 2.1.0. Have you thought about just doing promises A++ compliant? Yeah, but like, is that going to live long or is it going to die once uh, ECMAScript 6 starts going on? Yeah, it's like, <laughs> what can you do? I have to be conservative. I don't want to break your applications. Any other questions? Anybody else, anybody here going to try ECMAScript 6 stuff? Good. So your your the core driver that you're making is just the server connection. So there's no nothing like Jesse presented with SDAM. And no, no, it ha has all of that. that it's just it's, it's all the it's all the stuff that you really don't care about if you're actually writing something that okay. on stuff. Uh, on so it does collect. It does connect to a cluster. Yeah, yeah, but okay. you have to specifically tell it that you're connecting to okay. a cluster. <laughs> Jess is asking a question. He's the guy who wrote that spec. Hey, um, and relevant to that, I noticed that you say yield new client dot connect. Yeah. Um, and then you do a yield, you know, find one or something. Um, is the connect necessary, or would it do it on demand if you had not yet yielded for connect before doing an operation? It's a um, combination of uh, bad decisions in the past and having mm, to live with those decisions and making it not break for people going forward. I'm familiar with that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I mean, there's like lots of ways of doing it. Like, you know, if you, if you want to do it a better way now, you can do connect, and then you can listen to the connect event, which is like the better Node.js way of doing stuff. But because I'm sure there's like millions of lines of code out there using that thing, I can't do anything about it. Got it, thanks. Yep. All right, so function star syntax, I should have probably said that. Function star syntax uh, is the, this specific thing that you're declaring a generator. And so it's just like a, a way for them to say that this function is a generator. So a normal function, when you call it, it will return a value, right? But if you call it a star function, it will return you an iterator object with a next function on it. So that's basically what it says. You never declare the next function, but the function itself just returns that. So if you create your own function, do uh, take it out and, and just you know do inspect on it or something, you'll see that it's an object with the next function on it. So if you have a function that's not function star, do you think yielded it? Oh yeah, 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 it will scream. Also, like you have to use strict with these things, so it, it won't even like load the, the the file. It will just give you an error immediately. All right. Anything else? Otherwise, you know we're off to the museum. Uh, as keynote, yeah. Sorry, don't miss the keynote.